We're in a high school parking lot right before class lets out and a torrent of teens descends to take their driver's license tests. Just like a driving test is all about assessing whether or not you can be safe on the road, our subject today is all about assessing safety of the fetus. Antenatal testing, also called antepartum fetal surveillance, consists of tests done with the express purpose of preventing fetal death in utero. We'll go over the different types of tests that can be done in a bit, but first, let's review whom exactly should get antenatal testing. The complete list of conditions that qualifies a pregnancy for antenatal testing is extensive, so we'll cover the main conditions you may encounter here. In general, antenatal testing should be done in pregnancies that are at higher risk of an intrauterine fetal demise due to some pathology that can affect fetal oxygenation status. Prime examples are the hypertensive diseases in pregnancy, such as preeclampsia, which often lead to worsening uteroplacental insufficiency as the pregnancy goes on. We'll symbolize these with high-pressure air escaping out of this tire. Moms with diabetes, both pre-existing and gestational diabetes, should undergo antenatal testing. To remind you of this, we'll use our recurring symbol for diabetes, candy. Pregnancies with intrauterine fetal growth restriction, symbolized by this driving instructor crammed in the back seat, or oligohydramnios also qualify for antenatal testing. Late-term and post-term pregnancies, represented by this tardy slip on the red car, should also be tested, as should multifetal gestations, represented by these multiple baguettes in her trunk. Huh, no wonder she was tardy. She was on a bread-buying spree. Another time testing is indicated is when mom notices decreased fetal movement, symbolized by the stop sign. In terms of when to start testing, many providers will have different thresholds to start, but the general window in which it started is between 32 and 34 weeks gestational age, which is why we've slapped a 32 on this speedy sports car. Hmm, maybe not the best car to take your driving test with? Okay, now on to the good stuff, the tests themselves. Except for the first one that we'll review, antenatal testing consists of some combination of a fetal heart tracing and an ultrasound. In an earlier sketch, we reviewed that fetal heart tracings reflect fetal oxygenation status in the short term. Antenatal testing takes this into account and also incorporates proxies for chronic oxygen depletion. The idea is that a fetus with acute and chronic hypoxia will exhibit certain signs of distress before a full-on demise. The goal with antenatal testing is to find these signs and intervene before it's too late. First up is fetal kick counting, which is when moms are instructed to count their fetus's kicks. This is the first test used if a mom is worried that her fetus is moving less. This is a concern to be taken very seriously. In fact, decreased fetal movement may be the first noticeable sign that something is wrong. One way to try to objectively quantify if the fetus is moving enough is to instruct mom on how to do fetal kick counts. There are many ways to do this, and there's no one standardized counting method used across the board. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends using the threshold of 10 distinct movements in two hours as the minimum of what's considered adequate fetal movement. We'll remind you of 10 movements within two hours with this biker girl flashing a peace sign and wearing a 10 helmet. She's also on a bike with a big kickstand. If mom is feeling less than 10 movements in two hours, then she should come in to be evaluated further with one of the following methods. Next up is the non-stress test. The NST is done by using a fetal heart rate monitor for 20 minutes. We'll represent the NST with this no stress bumper sticker over on this car on the right. Remember all the way back to our fetal heart tracing sketch? We spoke about the two things that can reliably exclude fetal acidemia, moderate variability and accelerations. The non-stress test takes into account the latter of these two things. This test requires two fetal heart rate accelerations in at least 20 minutes. Sometimes, because of the fetal sleep-wake cycle, which also tends to last 20 minutes, the test may need to go on for longer. The result of this test is either dubbed reactive or non-reactive, with reactive being the good one. A reactive NST is what we just mentioned, two fetal heart rate accelerations within a 20-minute time span. We'll symbolize a reactive NST on our no-stress car with two accelerating blasts coming from its tailpipes. The hubcap on this car also has a cool 20-minute design on it, and the license plate says reactive. A non-reactive NST is less than two fetal heart rate accelerations within a 40-minute time span. This blue car to the left is showing no accelerating blasts, and its hubcap design is set to 40 minutes. 
One way to speed things up if this happens is to wake the fetus up with the in utero version of an alarm clock. Vibroacoustic stimulation, represented by these vibrating headphones on one of our drivers. To perform vibroacoustic stimulation, you place a special vibrating device on mom's belly and buzz for a few seconds. You can try up to three times to get a response, aka an acceleration, before you should become concerned. A study demonstrated that fetuses that have a reactive NST have a markedly reduced rate of stillbirth than those with a non-reactive NST. This doesn't mean that if you have a non-reactive NST that you'll definitely have a stillbirth. Rather, the significance of this is that a reactive NST is very reassuring of fetal well-being. Another test that's similar to the NST is the contraction stress test, or CST, represented by this contract brake sign in front of the stressed out driver. Like the NST, the CST also requires that your patient be hooked up to the fetal heart rate monitor and tachometer. The patient must have an adequate uterine contraction pattern in order for the test to be active, which means at least three contractions in a 10 minute window. These contractions can be spontaneous or they can be stimulated with Pitocin. What you're looking for is whether or not there are late decelerations on the fetal heart tracing in response to the contractions. A negative contraction stress test means there are no decelerations, either late or variable. A positive contraction stress test means that there are late decelerations seen with 50% or more of the contractions. That's why we've put this late decel score sheet in the car marked with the big plus sign. Anything that lies in between those two is considered an equivocal CST, and more clinical information and context should be used to assess fetal well being. This terminology is a little confusing because a negative CST is a good thing while a positive CST is concerning. Lastly, we have the biophysical profile, a much more extensive antenatal test. The biophysical profile consists of five components, an NST and four ultrasound criteria. To remind you of this, we drew in a car taking the backwards parallel parking test, it's another kind of BPP, and the car's got a no stress sticker on it. The instructor administering the test is yelling through a big bullhorn, which represents the ultrasound. Each component of the BPP is worth two points. So with five components, this means a BPP is scored out of 10 total points, with the score of 10 being the most reassuring. What can get a little confusing is that each component only can get a score of zero or of two. So not a one. We've already gone over the first component of a BPP. It's an NST. A reactive one will get you two points. A non-reactive one gets you zero. The next four components are all assessed via ultrasound, and you get 30 minutes to complete this scavenger hunt. The first ultrasound criteria is fetal movement, symbolized by these movement lines on the instructor with the bullhorn. To get a full two points, you need to see three or more body or limb movements within 30 minutes. Next up is fetal tone. For this one, you're going to want to see a limb flex or extend at least one time, just like this walk signs person's limbs are doing. Or if that little fetus doesn't feel like pumping iron quite yet, a hand opening and closing will suffice, which will symbolize with this hand stop sign. Fetal breathing is our next ultrasound criteria, and for the full two points, you should see a continuous 30 second stretch of fetal breathing. It looks like the chest and abdomen are, well, breathing heavily just like this nervous student is in the purple car. The final component is another thing you've already encountered, the deepest vertical pocket of amniotic fluid. This one is easy. You want a vertical pocket of amniotic fluid of at least two centimeters, which is symbolized with this ruler measuring two centimeters in a puddle of water. So you've done your NST, patiently waited for 30 minutes with an ultrasound probe on mom's belly, and you've tallied all your points. But what does it mean? A score of eight to 10 means all is good. The fetus is well. A score of six is equivocal if the amniotic fluid volume is normal and the BPP should be repeated in about 24 hours. A score of six with low fluid is abnormal and treated as such, which we'll go over in a bit. A score of four or less is abnormal and there should be some sort of intervention, likely delivery. Before we continue on to discuss the management of an abnormal antenatal test, there's one more thing we have to mention, which is called the modified BPP. The modified BPP is a simpler version of the BPP and consists of just two of the five criteria, the NST and the DVP. 
The reason that these two components are chosen is that the NST reflects current fetal acid base status, while the DVP is reflective of fetal perfusion over a longer period of time. Because remember, amniotic fluid is fetal pee, and the fetus needs to be adequately perfused in order to make enough of it. A normal modified BPP consists of a reactive NST and a DVP of greater than or equal to 2 centimeters. If either one of these components isn't met, then the modified BPP is considered abnormal. So now you've done your NST or your BPP or your modified BPP and the fetus isn't getting the scores you want. What do you do? If kit counts are abnormal, you should perform an NST. If an NST or a CST are abnormal, then you should perform a BPP. If a BPP is abnormal, then depending on the gestational age, the most likely thing you'll do next is deliver the fetus. In general, the management of abnormal antenatal testing can be nuanced and depends highly on gestational age and what the underlying condition is that's causing the abnormal test result. Delivery planning may involve collaboration with maternal fetal medicine, the high-risk obstetricians, and a number of other specialists. For our purpose here, if the antenatal test is abnormal, then deliver. And that's it for antenatal testing. We hope all these kiddos stay safe behind the wheel and that those fetuses stay safe in utero. Fingers crossed that they all pass the test.